ヤマトガンガムサシシーラツーユアカギユリュウはい、スティーブ。これはガスステーションの近くにあるスーシー。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。はい、スティーブ。Then our club will refight this incredible battle in six millimeter scale and see if our players can rewrite Japanese history. <laughs> you know those pants really make your ass look big. Huh. It's a little excessive, don't you think? Yeah, sorry about that, but uh, you know how it is when a samurai draws his sword and all that stuff? I'm not a samurai, you're a lawyer. Which is how I know you're not going to sue me. Hi, I'm Steve, this is Zach, and welcome Hi. to Little Wars TV. Ever since I was a kid in the 80s and saw this miniseries based on James Clavell's Shogun, I've been fascinated by Japanese history, particularly the age of the samurai. Well, where we are today may represent the peaceful ideal of traditional Japan. In the mid 16th century, the Japanese countryside was riven by brutal warfare. The central authority of the Japanese emperor and the Ashikaga shogunate was almost totally non existent. As a result, outside of Kyoto, the great provincial warlords, the daimyo, fought amongst themselves, seeking to expand their power and land holdings with the sword. This period of Japanese history, which lasted until around 1600, was known as the Sengoku Jidai, the age of the country at war. Amongst the Sengoku daimyo, one of the most powerful was Takeda Shingen, the Tiger of Kai. Born of ancient aristocratic lineage, Shingen trained a fearsome army in the shadow of Mount Fuji that specialized in the use of samurai cavalry. There was little doubt that Shingen was one of the few daimyo who really had a chance of bringing Japan and its fractured leadership at the time to heel. Before he could do so, however, he faced a significant hurdle. His home province of Kai was landlocked. As a step towards solving this problem, Shingen turned his gaze towards Shinano, a huge, sprawling province located to the northwest of Kai. While it too was landlocked, its size and lack of a single ruling daimyo and closer proximity to the Sea of Japan made it a tempting target. By the 1550s, Shingen had managed to conquer most of southern Shinano and appeared ready to finish the job in the north. In doing so, however, he would come into conflict with another daimyo who was every bit his match in ambition, leadership skills, and might of arms. As the Takeda forces slowly took over Shinano, the Dragon of Echigo, Uesuke Kenshin, was forced to counter them. Kenshin's province bordered on Shinano to the north and stood between its frontiers and the Sea of Japan. Kenshin suspected that if Shingen consolidated his control over Shinano, he and his lands were next on the chopping block. The weakly matched on the battlefield, Uesuke Kenshin and Takeda Shingen were in many ways exact opposites. Though both part of an ancient clan, Kenshin shared none of its ancient bloodline. He was actually born Nagio Kagatora and had earned his way into the family through military prowess and shrewd. Opportunism. And by the way, Kenshin had taken monastic vows and was a Buddhist monk. He never married and may have been celibate his entire life. Given their larger than life personalities and abilities on the battlefield, the clash between these two daimyo was certainly one for the ages. And in fact, in the 11 years from 1553 to 1564, these two generals met on the battlefield no fewer than five times. It's the fourth and bloodiest of these battles that we'll be recreating on the tabletop. By 1561, the Takeda and Uesuke armies had already met in large scale engagements three times, none of them decisive. All of them had taken place in and around the Kawanakajima Plain, a triangle of flat land surrounded by mountains at the confluence of the Chikuma and Sai rivers. Now, there's a good reason that all of these battles took place at this particular plain. It was a natural choke point, and the, and the routes between Shinano and Uesuke Kenshin's home province of Echigo ran right through it. Exactly. And in September of 1561, Kenshin decided to bait Shingen into a fourth battle on the Kawanakajima Plain in the hopes of ending their conflict once and for all. To do so, Kenshin led 13,000 men on a lightning march across the Kawanakajima Plain to the top of Saijosan, a small mountain overlooking a Takeda castle. This threat to a key castle along the Chikuma River forced Shingen to march from Kai, his capital, at the head of 20,000 men, arriving at Kaizu on October 8th. 
So a week later, perhaps tired of waiting, Takeda Shinga commits a classic blunder. He went in against a Sicilian when life was on the line? No, he divides his force in the face of an enemy. Wait a minute, no, no, that wasn't a blunder. That was actually part of a very sound plan, which, if successful, would result in the destruction of the Yoesage army. On the night of October 17th, Shingen puts into motion Operation Woodpecker, a plan devised by one of his most trusted generals. This plan called for 12,000 Takeda troops, under cover of darkness, to silently climb the eastern flanks of Saijo-san and launch a surprise dawn attack on Kenshin's forces at the summit. They would then drive Kenshin's forces off the mountain, down across the Chikuma River, and onto the Kawanakajima Plain, where Shingen would be waiting with his remaining 8,000 men. Kenshin would be trapped between the two halves of the Takeda army and crushed. So yeah, brilliant plan. Except for Kenshin didn't stay on the mountain. Whether he got word of Operation Woodpecker or just got lucky, but he left the mountain to the cover of darkness, crossed Chikuma River, and took up the position that Takeda was hoping to occupy the very next morning. So as dawn broke, and Takeda Shingen advanced with his 8,000 men and crossed the Chikuma River, he found himself effectively ambushed by Kenshin's army. The 12,000 men that he had sent to the top of Saijusan as part of Operation Woodpecker were no help at all. Okay, okay, admittedly that wasn't an ideal situation, but the 12,000 men up on Saijusan realized what was going on pretty quickly and immediately rushed to their daimyo's aid. So the troops committed to the Woodpecker plan did get to the battle eventually and forced Kenshin to withdraw through force of numbers. But the fact that it turned out okay for Shinken didn't mean that, that plan wasn't a mistake. You really are a sake bottle half empty kind of guy, aren't you? Because, yeah, fine, the Woodpecker plan didn't result in the decisive victory that Shinken had hoped for, but he was still victorious and controlled the field at the end of the day. If anyone blundered in this battle, it was Kenshin. Facing a total enemy force that was almost twice his size, once he got down off of Saijoshan, he should have headed back home. Instead, he chose to fight a battle that he had virtually no chance of winning, and as a result, lost as many as 70% of his men to casualties, and almost 30% of them were killed. No chance of winning? When he sprang his ambush, Kenshin had numerical advantage of thousands of soldiers over Takeda Shingen's force that was pinned against the river. They had every chance of scoring a quick victory. They even came face to face in a duel. They could have ended it right there and then. Ah, uh, yes, arguably the greatest story of one-on-one -on -one combat during the entire Sengoku period. In some reports of the battle, chroniclers tell of Kenshin, on horseback, bursting into Shingen's headquarters area and striking three times at the Takeda Daimyo with his sword before being beaten back. Each time, however, Shingen warded off the blows with his war fan. It's a great story, to be sure, but it may not be much more than that, just a story. There are conflicting accounts about whether Kenshin was actually involved in the duel as opposed to one of his men, and in fact, there are conflicting accounts as to whether Kenshin was even there. Fair enough. Whether Kenshin was there personally or not doesn't really matter. The fact is that Takeda Shingen came really close to losing his head that morning, and had that happened, it would have been a total win for the USK. Unless Kenshin gets himself killed too as a result of keeping his army on the field in between two Takeda forces. Okay, let's just agree to disagree. I'm confident I can prove my point when we refight the Battle of Fourth Kaba Nakajima on the miniature battlefield. Speaking of which, we should probably get back to the club and get that game started. Yeah, I'm getting a little hungry. Do you want to hit up that sushi I mentioned earlier? I don't think that's such a good idea. Why not? Three words. Gas. Station. Sushi. This is our tabletop recreation of the Kawanakajima battlefield, with both the Uesugi and Takeda forces arrayed as they were historically on the morning of October 18, 1561. These are 6mm figures painted specifically for this battle, so the unit and individual banners you see match 16 out of the dozens of different commanders actually present in the fight. So how was Japan? Any good sushi? Oh, not a good subject, I'm afraid. But uh, anyway, guys, here we are. This is the fourth battle of Kawanakajima. Uh, Keith, Zach, you'll be controlling the forces of Uesage Kenshin, and Dieter and Greg, you're going to be controlling the forces of Takeda Shingen. And your mission here today is simple. Survive. The Uesage forces really outnumber you. Your back is up against the Chikuma River. Your only real hope is to hold out until your woodpecker force arrives. How long will that be? 
I'm actually not going to tell you. While I know when the game is going to end, I'm not going to let the players know because that's going to keep the pressure on the Uesage forces to press their attack. Because your objective here is to either kill Shingen outright or break his forces and make him flee from the field. If you wait too long to do that, the Woodpecker force would be appearing on the table and at that point you'd either have to flee or face total annihilation. I assure you that aggression will be no problem. I'll have Shingen's head before those peckers get off Sizer Sun. Hi! Wood peckers. Wood peckers. <laughs> Whatever. So, what rules are we going to be using today for this battle? We're going to be using Killer Katanas 2. There are a few Sengoku Jedi era rule sets out there, and I think all of them have their problems and none are really ideal. That being said, I do think Killer Katanas 2, because it is more of a simulation of feudal Japanese warfare, gives us the best chance of really resolving this in a way that hopefully we'll all find satisfying. For a more detailed discussion of Killer Katanas 2 and a look at some of the other rule sets that you can use to refight some of the battles of the Sengoku Jedi, tune in next week for my rules roundup here on Little Wars TV. All right, all of that sounds good, but I do have a question, even though I'm not sure I want to know the answer. Uh, we usually have stakes in these games. What's the punishment for the losers this time? Oh, never fear. I've picked out something that is quintessentially Japanese. Oh, nice. Tentacle porn? <laughs> no. Uh, actually, the losers will get to take part in a bout or two of sumo. Oh, I look terrible in diapers. <laughs> Well, it could be worse. It's not like he's making us wear anime t-shirts or wear paper helmets. Well, actually... I hate you. I know. I think we're about ready to get started, so why don't you guys head downstairs and start planning, and I'll send the Uesage to uh, formulate their plan as well. If you'd like to play this scenario at home with your own miniatures, all the scenarios we use here on Little Wars TV are available on our website, littlewarstv.com. Check them out. So, my lord, what is our plan of attack here today? Uh, well, attack is probably the wrong word, because that would be pretty foolhardy, I think. Uh, if uh, the river seems to be somewhat fordable, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that retreating and making a stand on the other side of the river uh, would be the wise thing to do, instead of fighting with our backs to it. Yeah, doesn't give us a whole lot of room for maneuver, though. Right, uh, well, either way, I guess we're not going to have a whole lot yeah, of room for yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of maneuver anyway. I right. think we're just going to defend and hope that we can hold them off. Hi, everybody. I'll be taking the role of the Warlord Uesuke Kenshin. I will be playing Tekamana Hiratsuna. Keith is leading the van of this very interesting formation. The pinwheel formation. The pinwheel. Doesn't look very much like a linear battle line, so we're going to spend our first couple turns trying to turn it into a usable attack formation. And I'm going to drive hard at Takeda's center, and hopefully challenge, very unwisely, Takeda Shingen to a personal combat to live up to the legend of this battle. And I'm going to do as much as possible to engage his, the rest of his battle line to prevent him from yeah. stopping them. Yep. Before we begin, just a quick note for those who may already be familiar with Killer Katanas 2. Because we're using 6mm figures mounted on 30 by 60 millimeter bases, we aren't able to use the normal individual base removal system to denote losses during the course of a game. Instead, we created separate record sheets to keep track of unit losses as well as some other information. With that business taken care of, let's get on with the battle. As the final wisps of morning fog lift from the Kawanakajima Plain and the battle begins, Zack attempts to shake out his forces, which are located to the rear of the Uesugi pinwheel, into a battle line that can support Keith, who is much farther forward and closer to the Takeda. Unfortunately, this doesn't go nearly as smoothly as Zack had hoped, and he struggles to figure out how to keep his collection of smaller clan commands from getting in each other's way. Despite being well aware of Zack's struggles to organize himself, Keith, knowing that time is of the essence, pushes his men forward, charging straight at the heart of the Takeda line. This unexpected early attack immediately has Dieter and Greg reconsidering their plan for a defense-first strategy anchored on the banks of the Chikuma River. They calculate that, with Zack unable to support him, Keith is dangerously overextended. This seemingly presents an opportunity to destroy the Uesugi vanguard and potentially even up the odds. 
Our Takeda generals, in true samurai fashion, decide to seize this opening and do so by mounting their own countercharge across the Kawanakajima plain to meet Keith. When the two lines crash together, it does not take long for Greg and Dieter to realize they've made a terrible mistake. Keith's men prevail in combat after combat, while in a truly shameful display, the defeated Takeda units repeatedly fail their morale checks, leaving them fleeing back to the river. The lone bright spot for the Takeda in these early phases of the battle comes when they're able to employ one of the few arquebusier units on the table. It doesn't do much to slow Keith down, but it does give Zack a chance to place some of his trademark artisanal tabletop cotton. Yeah, at the, the beginning of turn two, we kind of saw that uh, Keith uh, was a little overextended and isolated, so we went contrary to our original plan and decided that was something we could pounce on and, and we could maybe grind that down really quick before anything could support it. That was the right move at the time. Um, it, was, it was a sound decision, but things didn't work out for us. <laughs> the only good news that I see at this point in the game is that Zack is still pretty far away because we have been able to maneuver, shift over a little bit to keep the fighting away from Zack. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's good, but Keith doesn't even need Zack at this point. I mean, yeah. he's pretty much butchering us all on his own. Yeah. Wow, you're really kicking their ass. I am kicking their ass. Uh, I have punched a hole in his lines um, and have now contacted with most of my army, doing well, but I'm taking a lot of losses. So with that hole punched, well, hopefully I'll be able to bring up the uh, Uesuke clan, exploit this big gap in their lines, punch straight through, and take Shingen's head. Hopefully before the peckers show up. Despite a sense that the impetus of his headlong early charge is beginning to wane, Keith continues pushing forward. Given precious little time to recover from their early losses, Greg and Dieter have no choice but to call in their emergency reserves from the opposite banks of the river. Heeding his liege lord's call, Lord Atobe Katsusuke leads a thousand fresh troops across the shallow Chikuma, and his men arrive none too soon, finally blunting Keith's attack. Just as this small, flickering flame of hope appears to our beleaguered Takeda generals, however, Hachiman, the Japanese god of war, laughs and appears to extinguish it. In Killer Katanas 2, Movement order in each turn is determined using a small deck of cards. As each card is turned over, only the infantry or cavalry for a single side is allowed to move. In our battle, red cards permitted Takeda forces to go, while black ones indicated it would be the Uesugi's turn. At this critical juncture of the fight, where the Takeda look to finally have a chance to recapture a little bit of the initiative, movement card after movement card continue to come up black giving instead the Uesuge total freedom of action. This enables Zack to finally push all the way forward with the entire weight of Uesuge numbers and slam into what remains of the Takeda line. Unable to hold off this fresh attack, the Takeda flanks collapse back and anchor on the shores of the Shikuma River as they desperately try to avoid being overwhelmed. Well, turn five was uh, just about the worst imaginable turn for us. It started off with five or six black cards in a row. It was ugly. That was ugly. Um, at this point, I'm thinking that it will be uh, it'll be pretty untenable unless the woodpecker force arrives next turn uh, for us to win the game. It's bad. Finally, the movement cards begin to turn up Takeda Red, and Greg and Dieter wisely use them to fall back across the river and organize a defensive line upon its far banks. It's a strong position that will be very difficult to attack, which presents Keith and Zack with an agonizing choice. Either attack immediately and risk a repulse, or take precious time to reorganize their forces and give themselves the best chance to win a final engagement quickly. They choose the latter option desperately hoping that the Woodpecker Force is still multiple game turns away. At last, in turn 7, they begin to wade across the Chikuma to deliver the killing blow. At the beginning of turn 8, however, 
Kenshin's worst fears are realized as the lead elements of over 10,000 fresh, frantic, and frenzied Takeda troops have descended from Saijo-san's peak and are rushing towards Kenshin's rear. The precariousness of Zack and Keith's situation is immediately clear. If they push forward with their assault on Shingen's position, even if they succeed, they will themselves become trapped. Faced with the realization that the decisive victory that was almost within their grasp has now floated away like cherry blossom petals on a spring breeze, Zack and Keith are left with no choice but to retreat in the hopes of finishing the job another day. <sighs> a shameful display. So, I blew the hole in the line and everything was looking great. I was taking massive casualties, but it was working and you were working your way into to meet the enemy, but not fast enough. The peckers showed up and we were forced to flee back to Echigo. <laughs> well, we pulled it off barely. <laughs> Are we supposed to feel good about it? I don't feel good. We, we avoided being completely crushed. I don't. I didn't look to see what the final casualty count was. I'm sure Steve will tally it up. But for for my command, it, it was clearly well over fifty percent. It feels like a loss, <laughs> yeah. even though we technically won. Yeah. I don't know how we held on until turn eight. Uh, this was a real nail biter. And um, I, looking back on it, I, I guess in hindsight we should have stuck to the original strategy of anchoring ourselves behind the river. Would have been an uninteresting game, but that. Might have been better than us lunging out there after Keith. It, it was a chance that it made sense to take. It did. I would take yeah. it again, probably. It just didn't work out. <laughs> and if we had retreated from the very beginning, they would have been able to hit us all at once. We kind of engaged them piecemeal as they willed us down. Well, we held on for the win, though, if, if you can call it a win, a Pyrrhic win, perhaps. So, uh, well played, sir. Yep, you too. And we don't have to wear those silly sumo suits. We do not have to wear the sumo suits. Although, I gotta say, I was worried about sumo wrestling you, because I think you outweigh me. But... Yeah. Somebody did it! Oh, thank God we're not that fat. That's stupid. That was dumb. <laughs> Thanks for watching Little Wars TV. Hit subscribe and be sure to catch our next episode. And all bonus videos coming next week.